Welcome to season two of Service UK's podcast, Blood, Sweat and Dears. I'm your host, Owen Beardsmore. And I'm your co-host, Dan Beardsmore. And we'll be bringing you regular conversations with experts in the field of deer management, deer stalking and associated topics. In this first episode, we'll be joined by passionate countryman and gamekeeper, Tony Lowry, whose lifelong interest in the welfare of deer led him to create the UK DTR. We really hope you enjoy this episode as much as we enjoyed recording it. I hope it's a great evening. My guest tonight is the man, myth, the legend, Tony Lowry from Down Hampshire. Tony, welcome. How are you? Thank you. I'm very well. Thank you, Owen. And yeah, thanks. Thanks for the call. Um, we got it sorted out eventually. The technology. <laughs> <Slight> technical delay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's the trouble, isn't it? Us old silverbacks. But anyway, Absolutely. we've sorted it out now. And uh, well, thanks for coming on our, our first of our podcasts for uh, the new season. Um, we haven't done anything for about 12 months. And I think I asked you if, years ago if you'd come on and do it. Uh, it was just a yeah. period of time when I hadn't got a tracking dog. Uh, and I'd contacted you um, as I'd had a client lose a deer, or I'd lost a deer, the client had shot and we'd lost a deer, and you turned up uh, with Hemi, if I remember rightly, your Hanoverian. Yeah. yeah. And um, so, without much ado, tell us a little bit about UK DTR, how you got into it, and how long you've been doing it, and um, and, and really how it started. Um. It started for me, Owen. I met um, my mentor, if you like, um, Kim, Kim Jorgensen, who's a Danish chap, um, lives in the north of Denmark. Met him at uh, a day in uh, Devon, day near Oakhampton. He was putting on um, um, a little day showing what tracking dogs can do. Um, at that time, there was there, there weren't tracking dogs. There were stalkers that had dogs that found their deer. Um, but what they did in Denmark was something quite new, really, to us, anyway, in the UK. And I saw what his um, his Labrador could do. He had a Labrador at the time. It was the best tracking dog I've ever seen. Um, uh, and that sort of got me going a little bit. And I had a Labrador. And then I, I bought a hound, a Hanoverian, as you know. Um, yeah. and, and we sort of took it from there. And we got together with um, Richard Evans, who's from your part of the world. I know, Rich, yeah. Yeah, yeah Rich. And, and one or two lads, um, from you may remember from the Scent End Association, um, George Ritchie and... and um, chap called Paul Ventress. We got together with them, Richard and I went up to Scotland and met them with a view to starting an organisation similar to what was running Denmark and Germany and Europe. When was um, this, Tony? That would have been, I can't remember, it's at least 10 years ago, probably yeah. a little bit more, yeah. um, before George set up the UK Scent End Association. Um, anyway, um, we met with them with a view of setting something up and, and we, we had a few disagreements over a few things and went our separate ways. And Richard uh, um, and myself and one or two other the senior members set up UK DTR. Um, and, and it went from there, really. And, and we learnt, we, we spent a lot of time travelling to Denmark just watching what the Danes were doing. Um, they've got a very good system. They track a lot of stuff from the road. So if you hit a a deer uh, with your car in Denmark, you have to phone the police and then the police phone trackers and then they yep. track stuff from the road, um, yep. which happens in a lot of um, European countries. And they also um, are on hand to help out stalkers and hunters when they can't find their, their deer. So they do a hell of a lot more for us and got a lot more experience than us. So we, we were learning and we're still learning now. So that's where it started. And, and Kim helped us out in the early days. And, and we've gone on since there, really developed our own tests uh, based pretty much on how the Danes do things, to be honest. I know. Um, my, my first uh, experience with tracking dogs is similar to that. Um, uh, years ago, um, we did some initial dogs for deer training uh, on when I used to have Stoner Estate. And we had Neil, Neil Sondergaard came over um, and we did it with Basque. And we were very much the venue and the sort of like the practical side. We had to have the deer there for us to work on and everything but it was incredibly interesting and uh, we did two or three of those um with neil sondergaard and he had a book all about it and he's he he led with a with a labrador it's funny isn't it he led a labrador and and he i can remember him explaining this now i would have said that was probably in the early noughties to be honest that was yeah it would have been probably 2002 2000 something like that and uh, and i think Basque went on with it just to get guys, you know, um, using the dogs and training. But 
one of the things that was the most um, memorable things on that was there was a group of guys there. And there was a friend of mine there, and he just got a Bavarian Mountain Town pup. We'd imported two from Poland, um, but they took six months to come in, and a Dutch guy had had them and already done the basic training. So we kind of got them already on blood trails. But there was a lad there that had brought one in, and it was a, just a pup, I don't know, maybe 16, 18 weeks old. And there it was. And that was on the very first day, we all had to stand there outside with our different dogs at the back of our cars, and he pointed at this one. He said, at the end of these two days, that, that puppy there is going to do a 200-meter blood trail. And anyway, we did all these different things. And, and do you know what? It did it. It was incredible. And it was all in there. And it just it didn't do it without any falter. And he, you know, he, 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 one of the things he explained about the dogs is the scent towns are a totally different breed. And he kind of drew a balloon off the nose of several dogs. And then he did this massive one. And, uh, and he said, you know, sometimes perhaps they take on too much information. You know what I mean? Whereas perhaps the Labrador and that, they're, they're perhaps quicker to work out the jigsaw puzzle, if you know what I mean, where the Bavarian has to dismiss everything. You know what I mean? And keep going to the one side, keep coming back, keep coming back. And, but I've always had Bavarians um, and uh, I would love a Hanoverian, but I just haven't got the room. <laughs> <laughs> but um, anyway, I've waffled on. Um, so... I, what we try and do within Service UK and uh, on these podcasts is for people who are starting deer stalking, deer management, got the first piece of ground, they're going out and shooting deer. If they shot and lost one, what was what is the procedure from the moment they've lost it? What if, if we've got to go through it moment by moment, how should they proceed, Tony? Basically, it's, it's pretty simple, actually. I, I mean, try and recall um, reaction to shot, um, what the animal's actually done. Um, mark the spot where you've taken the shot from. Go and have a look for the shot site and try and mark where you think the shot site is. And by all means, have a bit of a look. But the, usually the more you look, and depending on what the injury is to the animal, um, yeah. you can sometimes make matters worse for yourself or anybody else coming in, uh, as you know. Um, yep. it, is a, it is a team effort, so it's a dog and a handler. So when we're called in to look um, for an animal, we're, we're trying, to find, uh, trying to find what's gone on from the shot site. Now, with the best will in the world, people think, oh, yeah, I've always hit that in the engine room, uh, and they're convinced they fit in. They're not lying. That's what they actually think has actually happened. But sometimes it's not. Um, they can be hit all over the place. So we're looking at what's on the floor to decide our, our course of action. So from the stalker point of view is, Mark where you took the shot. Go and have a look at the shot site. See if you can find the shot site. Mark where the shot site is. And then if you can work out what's happened yourself. I mean, if you think you've hit it in the gut, then leave it and yeah. just pull back and call somebody or go and yeah. get your own dog or whatever. Um, if, you, if you hit it in the leg, then that's a very mobile animal and that really needs to be left for quite some time. As you know, if you remember the one we did for you yeah. when, when your dog was getting old, yeah. I came and looked for it. And because basically, because you didn't know, you'd literally been up and down that wood with your thermals and looked and that animal was gone. That roadback had gone. Yeah. But because it was quite a big roadback, it had come back with that injury. And it wasn't much of an injury, I know. No. And then the, the chap, the client came back and he shot it again and, and got it slightly wrong again. And, and Declan came and actually yeah. find the animal for you. So the best thing to do is not look too much the worst thing you could do particularly with a mobile animal so anything in the legs or gut sometimes that animal is going to keep going and the more you push it the further it will go the fallow even worse so they will normally run into cover and lie up um and if you if you leave it you've got a much better chance for recovery the, the, the stats from denmark as i say where we learn our stuff is it, it mo one out of four animals are not recovered if you follow it up, if you if you really push it on so the the, the, yeah. the, the it goes up quite a lot the you know the chance of finding an animal really rises to quite high percentage if you leave it and then go in later on i know yeah. we're british and we want to get that animal and, and end the yeah. up straight away sometimes the best course of action is to leave it pull out mark, do those things mark the shot site mark where you're taking a shot from and call somebody in and yeah. go back later on. That animal will go, you know, maybe two, three hundred yards in the cover and stay there. If it's in my defence, Your Honour, <laughs> on that day, I thought, 
we got that day. So I went and got Basher, put her on it. And if you remember, she'd actually done the same line yeah. that, that your dog took. And I marked it with bits of loo paper, done whatever I'd always done with my Bavarian. And then she just, I think she lost her by a ditch and your dog went over the ditch. And if you remember, it was May and it went into yeah, sort was, of like five rape. foot high rape <laughs> all the way around the wood, wasn't it? Yeah. And your yeah, dog was yeah. in there for like two hours, and it must have been literally chasing it round, to be honest. But it exactly. was exactly we could, you could have, was, and you're getting getting the rape, and you, it's it terrible. Was the best day that wasn't, to be honest. Yeah, it was yeah. a, a, an horrendous one, and then um, and then yeah, to to, to, to perhaps for, to, to, for the listener to finish that story later on in the week, um, I put a camera out, and he was back with a really bad limp. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the client was a very good friend of mine and a, and come for years. And I thought, well, if he's going to be in there and he's only got a shoulder graze, we'll get him. So yeah. we went out, never saw him. So I went and stalked out the field margins. And the rate, although it was a big field of rape, there was some, um, some stewardship margins, which were all full of flowers. And there he was, 40 metres in front of us, looking straight at us. I wasn't sure, but it's a massive book. It's a big, a big silver. I thought it was gold, actually. It measured silver in the end. But anyway, put up the sticks, got him on it, 40 metres. He doesn't miss. You know, he's a good shot, despite the, the, the initial shot. And he shot it and, it, and it literally dropped to the floor. We walked into it. I wrote all about this for Rifle Shoot. We covered it quite a bit. We never put it out as a film because I think it would have people wouldn't have perhaps got it unless they were there, you know what I mean? And it, I'm not making any excuses, um, but it was probably one of the worst scenarios I've ever been in. So we walked forward thinking he necked it. You know, I fived each other big or very both emotional because of, the, of what we'd been through. And it walked through and I couldn't find it. And I crouched down. And I looked and all the um, all the rape was, you know, in full flower and hanging over. And there in this arch, I can see this deer curled up like a Labrador looking at me. And I'm like, give me the gun, give me the gun. And I'm literally just about to put a shot on it and it got up and ran off. And I'm like, you know, where's that gone? So he went and there's a big patch of blood. So that's when I did do, I got your words echoing in my ears. It, it was... <laughs> That was in the evening. We pulled off it, and I um, I, I rang back up, and I think you were um, having, I a mass- Denmark. having a massage or something. You weren't available. I was in <laughs> anyway, I was in Denmark, Owen. Super deck arrived with Kong. Oh my God, what a dog that was! It yeah. jumped out the truck, and the ground shook, and he put that anavarian on it, and. Um, I went to one side of the wood case. It came out. Deck went in the other, and we kept in touch on radio. And um, and I could see it lying down by this pheasant pen. I mean, we went in and went in in the dark, and I could see this deer laid down. So I just I was literally crouched down. And um, but we got this situation where I knew where Deck was coming from, but Deck didn't know where I was. And you know, so there wasn't really a shot. We, we neither of us could do it because it wasn't safe. Anyway, I said, "There's a deer." Anyway, it got up and then it started to go away. And he let the dog go. He was one side of it, and Kong came in and just boff. And I'll tell you. By the time both of us had got there, he, Kong had dispatched it, and uh, it was incredible. Um, but yeah, so um, anyway, we've gone off course. So the person who's listening, who's got their own ground, who's just done this, who's a rel- relatively new to deer stalking, he's he's marked it, and he, he's you know he's not sure what's happened. He's had a little bit of a look. Um, there isn't much blood, but there's a big strike, and perhaps a bit of bone and meat. So he's mm, what shall I do? So he rings you up or rings the UK DTR number, and he gets somebody on the phone. Take me from there. Okay, well, firstly, um, if you get on the website, most most people got their phones now, you get on the website, and it's got a service on there called Find a Tracker, and it takes your location and puts you into contact with the nearest UK DTR person. And we've got a few more up north now, so you might be, you know, Scotland or somewhere like that or up north, yeah. so that will put you in touch with the nearest person. Um, when we get there, uh, what normally happens is we will have a look to see what's on the ground to try and ascertain where the animal has been hit um, and how long ago it was hit, and then you know follow the animal up from there. And it may, you know, may we may have to release the dog. Releasing the dogs is the last um, straw, really. And you've got to take into consideration where you are. So if you've got roads or railways or somewhere quite close to that ground, and the animal's liable to run across the road uh, and maybe cause an yeah. accident with a dog up its ass, of course, 
then yeah. um, you know we do ask that question you know because that depends on whether we're going to actually let if it's five thousand acres and there's no roads yeah we're in sight then we can sometimes release a dog on a on a mobile animal um but you have to take all that i had a cup i'd won a couple of years many years ago now and that was with my labrador and we down near eastley and uh we were following this animal uh, and we could see this animal it was actually stood in front of us and we had a main road school and cars and everything behind it and i said to the guy we can't i can't let the dog go on this and we can't shoot it because of where it was so yes. being a big buck like with yours i said to him come back tomorrow and he did he, he came back tomorrow and shot it but that was one of those scenarios where he couldn't release the dog he couldn't shoot it because of where it was uh, and we didn't want to risk it so we pulled out so it, it really depends on the scenario and what happens when we get there. Yeah, and it, and, it's, and when you've trained your dog to track, it's very difficult um, if you have let them go to kind of if 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 they pursue it a long way to try and call them off it, isn't it? You know what I mean? The, 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 yeah, the dog... my, mine's never coming off it. Um, no, no, no. Not, it's not like not like with your pheasant dog. You know. blow the when it stops. Um, when that con was let go in our wood, I climbed a tree. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, 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 you, you've got a, <laughs> as a tracker. As a tracker, you've got to make that call. You know, normally what happens is you either see it or hear it in front of you. Get up, and you know, and you find fresh blood up until that point. Yeah. You know, you yeah. get to a wound bed, and then you decide to release the dog. Yeah, um, and of course, there's a the boundary issues as well. Uh, yes, we've come across many boundaries where you get somebody saying he says that's the boundary we can't cross, not yeah. without permission. So then that happens a lot, where they don't have that problem. In no, no, no. I think I think you'll find that happens in um, quite a few European countries. That there's a, it's it's all about the animal, and if you, yeah. but but then they're registered as a tracker. You know what I mean? And um, it's not, you know, there's there's a there's a bona fide system in place that links yeah. into the, the the emergency services, isn't there? That they are. I mean, they the test they have to take is a government test. Yep. to test the dog and the handler and when they've passed out then then they're on call because say when they do the rta work the, the deer vehicle collision stuff they obviously um can go anywhere they, they then some they're limited sometimes military grain sometimes they have to make a phone call to go onto that but most of the time they can go through people's gardens or wherever they want and that's true of many european countries um but i can't see a law ever changing any time here soon <laughs> No, um, and you, you know the UK DTR. What do you? What's the normal? What's the the dog that they use the most? Are they are they sent towns or are they labs? And it's a good mix, actually. Owen, it's a good yeah. point. Um, uh, there are hounds, uh, pointers, German wirehead pointers, and, and Labradors, and and also crossbreeds. You got any um, techles in there? We have, we have. Yeah. Um, we got a lad. They're on, um, popular, aren't they? They're, they're bloody good, actually. Their their only problems is. Um, sometimes they're limited by the terrain and uh, you couldn't release your tackle to hold an animal at bay, although tackle yeah. owners will probably tell you <laughs> differently. Um, you know, fo following up, uh, releasing your tackle is going to be, but they are fantastic yeah. trackers. Um, we, we got some, a lad on Aaron who passed his test up in Scotland. Fant I tested that dog. Fantastic dog. Uh, really good dogs. Um, yeah. that, you know, they've got massive noses compared with the rest of their bodies. Yeah, and yeah. they're low to the ground anyway. Yeah. Um, that's what makes a good tracking dog. And and no, I wouldn't say, you know, people say, which are the best dogs? Um, I say the best tracking dog I ever saw was that Labrador of um, of Kim's. And that one, at the time, it's dead now, it died. But um, that won the Swedish and Danish track championships, as well as doing three to 400 live tracks a year. The, the championships are like field trials for tracking dogs. It blew everything else out of the water. It was the best yeah. dog I've ever seen. And that was a Labrador. But, you know, um, just some dogs are better than others. Like people, some people are better than other, uh, you know, than, than um, better. Uh, and what's about other. if you want, for, for somebody that's listening, is, uh, that's uh, an all round shooting man like you and me, um, would you use the same dog for both picking up? Well, well, dog if, shooting, if say that. and then, and, it's a question we get asked the most when we go to shows. Yeah. Um, can I have a dog that does both? Um, the answer is yes. And I say that tongue in cheek. Um, yeah. it, it, it's difficult. Um, you've, if you're going to have a tracking dog that also picks up, 
it's got to do the tracking work first. Now, I have a Labrador. She's nine now. Fantastic tracking dog. Also goes picking up now. But yep. for the first four years of her life, she did nothing except trail work, tracking work. So, and then because she's a retriever, she naturally retrieves. But as soon as the harness goes back on her, she goes back in a tracking mode. But I find it very difficult to run the, the two lots of um, training in parallel with each other. Um, yeah. Particularly when you're going out on the estates in this part of the world, because there was Pheasant City, you know, game yeah, 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 yeah. So yeah. your dog and your dogs sometimes ask to track through those things. So you need a dog yeah. which ignores pheasants and will track just the deer. Yeah. So it, it's a difficult one. So the answer is yes, but you've got to do the tracking work first for maybe three or four years. I, I find that really interesting what you said, because a million years ago, this would have been in the 90s, right? My first proper deer dog was a black Labrador called Daisy. And in those days, I used to fly hawks. Well, I used to fly sparrowhawks. And um, I wanted something a bit. So my dog was going to work cover to push out blackbirds from a sparrowhawk. It was going to find my roe deer and my munchak. And then it was also going to come down the river trend while I got tucked in there hopefully shooting an old Canada as it came back off the gravel pits. That was my dog, right? And that's, I managed to achieve that dog. And I was, um, through the uh, British Falconers Club and stuff I was involved with then, I got to know Guy Wallace, uh, the legend that is Guy Wallace. Uh, mm -hmm. um, I mean, he's passed away now. but And um, in those days, he was organising, um, I don't know if you remember this, but he, there was a falconry and deer fair up in Shropshire. Can you remember that? years yeah, ago really, right so and yeah. uh, so we were, were always involved with that because i was up there with the midland group of the british falconry british falcons club and um and i said to him i've got this labrador i'm just training it and then um but to be fair a guy turned tony kirby did the um the, the you know the advanced training in my lab because i was busy working he had a for six or eight weeks and then i had a back again did a season with did a you know some picking up with a and he said, right, when she's 12, 18 months old, Owen, um, Guy said, I'll have her. And um, we never agreed a price or anything. And and she went for months. I'm not kidding you. But it's like we hadn't got a dog anymore. And he bloody fell in love with this dog. And um, he took her all over the place. And she was, he came back and she was, she was always good with me. She'd been stalking me. But in those days, I used to stalk with her on heel. And I don't do that with my Bavarians. I, you know, the Bavarians are in the car and then they come if I need them. But so Daisy always walked that hill and a lot of the time would show me deer. You know what I mean? Um, and um, she was, she was, she was really good, really good on row, munchak and fallow. But then when I used to I had some ground in Scotland, whenever I took her up there, she just was, it was like she was terrified of seeker. She wouldn't go, she'd go on it. She did. Uh, Several stags we tried to follow. She, she'd be all right if she was on the ride or anything like that. She had to go into a block of Sitka spruce. She just, it was like hitting a sheet of glass. And, um, but it was still one of the, you know, one of the best utility dogs I had that did everything because she'd be out with me with a hawk. She'd be, you know, working in Hawthorne Edge for 100 yards or next day we might be out stalking or the following weekend we'd be duck shooting or something like that. So, um, you know, it's, I moved to specific that specific breed when I was doing it full time um, to, yeah. to, to um, scent hounds, um, but still got a lot of um, respect for Labradors and um, and their ability as well. Mm. It um, yeah, so we've got a mix of dogs actually, and we um, we I mean we we have to be a bit careful because we've been accused in the past of um, you know supporting crossbreeds and stuff like that but we don't we, we we're, we're a tracking organization not not a breed organization so we will welcome any dog into that any dog can do it and can do it and as long as they can pass our 20 hour old test then they're in um and the, the stalker has to be uh, or the tracker has to be quite an experienced stalker we generally like them to be at least level two or have similar experience you know yeah. um because it is a team effort we've had people in the past that have had um good tracking dog but non-shooters and that's not yeah. much good when you get to the end and you may yeah. have to dispatch an animal or know what yeah. you're looking for on the ground so um yeah it's definitely a, a team effort thing so, any yeah. any any wire heads any pointers that lads use that yeah yeah um, um quite a few pointers now um yeah. and crossbreeds as well so yeah. lab lab pennine pointers um 
Labrador cross pointer. Yeah, wirehead pointer. Oh, really? No, so I, I was looking at your social media before we had this, and there's yeah. quite a bit on there about the, the, you know, the had courses you're now involved with. Um, yeah. So that's kind of a, a development of what you're doing there, isn't it? You know, it's always about welfare and injured deer and everything like that. And uh, is that only happening down in Hampshire? Tell us a little bit about that. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm heavily involved. I've been involved with, um, probably like you, Owen, I've been involved with dispatching deer on the roadside for probably 45 years. Mm. Um, I go back to as probably as far as you when you had to knock on the door or the local policeman turned up yeah. and it was BSA Bantam or whatever and said, oh, there's a deer down the road, can you go and shoot it? Yeah. Um, but things have moved on a little bit now and, and Hampshire are sort of leading the way, although other constabularies have schemes. Wiltshire next door to us have one. East Sussex have a very successful scheme run by... Perhaps Highland. we haven't told the listener, had Humane Animal, animal Dispatch. dispatch. Yeah. We're talking yeah. about deer, deer that are yeah. on the roads, RTAs, yeah. and are left wounded or, you know, on the road or whatever. I've, 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 I've dispatched quite a few I have, but I'll be honest with you, the main thing I've used is a knife. Uh, it's, yeah, uh, it, 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 it's in best practice. As long as you know how to use a knife, it's yeah. acceptable. Um, I probably do 20, 25 a year. Um yeah. A lot, um, and I, I've, you think you've seen it all and every kind of dispatch going. You send some of the stuff I put yeah. on social media. I've done them on railways, um, dual carriageways, M ways, yeah, country lanes, everywhere. Um, I'm in quite a deer rich area to be honest. Yeah, uh, but anyway, what what Hampshire are doing now is they a few years ago they set up a scheme and we were trained by you probably remember the old deer initiative, Jamie Cordry. Jamie oh yeah, we uh, got together with um, the BDS and Hampshire Police and set up a, a classroom-based scenario test, which we all had to do. Yeah, but things have moved on again since that, and now we are um, we've all been scenario trained as well. So what they did, we went all went down to the armory down at Netley, and uh, the police firearms guys and the police set up scenario scenarios. So you, we're using um, archery targets, you know, these rubber rubber archery targets yeah. and, and, and cars and policemen and police vehicles and people in role play. And you were asked to go in and say how you deal with that as a had and how you dispatch it, um, which um, can be quite daunting to be honest, yeah. even though it's only, you know, you sort of not playing at it, but you know, so it, that was, and that's the way um, Hampshire's moved on. And they're also involved with somebody called Bartra. Now I'd never heard of Bartra before, we started this. It's British Animal Trauma Care. They're part of the fire brigade. So they oh. get pulled out when you get trapped animals and things like that and stuff, yeah. you know, set free. So, uh, and rampaging bulls and all that type of stuff. So they're involved in a lot of the classroom work. But, um, um, XL bullies. Yeah. I don't know about XL bullies. Yeah. So <laughs> that, you know, so the, the scheme, the scheme works where they're now offering it to other constabularies, um, throughout the country. Um, because as you know, uh, it's interesting, Owen. Um, I've been helping training um, Hampshire and Thames Valley firearms officers. Yeah. I haven't had shotguns. Cause to, I'll be honest with you, the, the, the right tool for the job, mostly it's a shotgun for most yeah, of the yeah, dispatches yeah. I do. Uh, yeah. And I've even gone to the, um, expand my expense of actually using your stuff. I was involved with a, a cull for Natural England. I'm not going to say what it was on here. Um which we had to use um, shotgun cartridges, which uh, were humane, but yeah. weren't going to blast cages to pieces. So I had this yeah. stuff developed uh, by the company that makes it for work with the had work. So I'm because I'm seeing more and more urban deer now hit by cars. Yeah. I'm curled yeah. into my local town. Um, so I wanted something which was safe, um, and this stuff is safe. So anything up to two meters, it, it does the job. Um, after three meters, it's completely inert. So if I shot you at five meters with it, with a 12 ball with this stuff, it's completely inert. You get more yeah. of a whack from the wadding and not from the shot. It's not shot, it's dust. So that's another tool in the box. Sometimes wow. you have to use lead, depending on 12, how you 12 ball. 12 ball, yep. Yeah. yeah. Only works in 12 ball. We've tried it in 410 yeah. and it wouldn't work. Um, sometimes you have to use lead, um, depending on where you are. Sometimes you need that dustbin lids, you know, uh, size yeah. pattern to actually get the animal down depending on where it is yeah um I very very rarely uh use a full ball rifle um if you need a full ball rifle it's usually got into the fields away from the road and then it's yeah. um, a or gamekeeper's problem 
Um, so as you say, a knife can be used. The trouble is you've got people watching you that perhaps don't understand yeah. that as well. That's the problem. Owen. I had, I had a um, situation. It's probably, do you know what? I reckon it was just after COVID and we'd been down in the Cotswold stalking. It's just me and Dan. I think we've been out and we, I don't think we could actually we could we could stalk as we were working and but I don't think we got clients or anything like that. anyway we're driving back on at 11 12 o'clock on a summer's evening long as longer the touristy straight piece of road and um I literally saw it happening there's a herd of deer came out and then this mini cooper hit the old lot of them boom and this mini comes stops and I said Dan saw it as well and we're like, pull up, and there's this girl, and she was a um, aerostess from, um, I presume, Birmingham Airport, heading south. We're heading north, and um, there, up the road behind her, is like three or four fallow, all, you know, heads up on the road kind of thing. And I just nipped out straight away, and I said, Dan, you just get out in the road and got the hazards going, and got and went to this girl, and she was just like, I don't know what's done. I said, just hit a load of deer. Just a minute. I'll be with you in a minute kind of thing. Get your hazards on. Pull over to the side of the road. And I ran up and I pulled them onto the version. I just, you know, stuck them really, you know, dispatched them all as quickly as I could. Mm. Um, and they're all prickets, to be honest. It was a group of, like, young males. Horrible to see it. You know, it's just horrible. They just hit the lights, boom, took them all out, and um, broken legs, just all in a right state. And... Um, Went back to see the girl. She'd rang her dad and told her what happened and we got her into the farm that farmyard and her dad was coming to pick her up. She had gotten no, she was that shocked. She didn't ask about the deer or anything. Um anyway, we, we I think we waited till her dad arrived. Um and then off we went. And Dan said to me, he said, Not many people could have just done what you did. And they, you don't think about it at the time, do you? You just hop out and do it. And 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 that's most times I've had to um uh, dispatch one. I had to dispatch one. Hang on. I've, I've even bored the head off. Hang on there. This is. You shouldn't leave a podcast and wander off. Again, I was down in the Cotswolds. This was this was last year, and I got clients. It was pouring me rain, and a roebuck came out into the road during the rut, and the car hit it. It went up in the air and landed, and it was pouring rain. I jumped out, dragged him in, and he was just kicking, and he was still alive. And I just dispatched him. But I just his head was such a lovely head. He smashed to bits, and you can see it's all been dragged up the road. Yeah. But I just it was such a beautiful old dark book. I just did the head because it was such a lovely, you know what I mean? It just it, it's probably a medal, but it was such a black book. Can you see that? Yeah, yeah. The person that's listening to a podcast, I'm showing a huge black headed row book, uh, black black um, very dark antlered black row book. But again. It was only with a knife, you know. I mean, I, it wouldn't. It wasn't a scenario where I could get a rifle out at all, you know. Um, yeah. And I don't. Again, I think I shot one in Hampshire that it was hit. This is middle of the day, and there was a whole queue of traffic, and I went, stopped, and I walked up the side, and they said, there's, "We've hit a deer. It's in them bushes, and it was a doe laid down." And I could actually go and do it, and I'd got no, I'd got no. I just did it. I made all the risk assessment in my head right there or there. I can do that there. It was down in a little bit of a, you know, got a bank behind it. But it wasn't very nice to do. And then the police all turned up while I was doing it. And they said, oh, thank God, you know, thank you. And I gave them my card and said, I do it as a job. Off you go. I never heard another thing off them. You know what I mean? But uh, it's, uh, and the more our deer population expands, the more we're hearing about our road RTAs, aren't we, with deer? And, you know, it's it, it's, it's a very weird yeah, thing. We, we are. Doing. I mean, that's what's been, you say, um, the, the sergeant running it, it will be offered to other constabularies nationally. And I'll be honest with you, Owen, um, the armed response guys, they're highly trained in what they do with nine millimeters and their the Glocks, their two two threes. But um, when it comes to deer, yeah, uh, so I've been helping training them. They have no, most of them, not all of them, the majority of them have never shot or killed anything in their lives. Yeah, You have to explain to them about um, the headless chicken thing. In other words, when you shoot an animal in the head, the yeah. blood is still in the body supplying oxygen to the nerves and you get that kicking and thrashing yeah. about. Um, th- there's cases where they've been shooting it again and again and again, thinking it's still alive. Um, yeah. They don't know there's six species of deer in this in this country. No. Um, and they, you know, they, they, 
and the best people for this are experienced stalkers, gamekeepers, pet controllers. Those yes. type of people, those are the people that have the experience to do this. And yeah. you're also, I mean, we're volunteers, so we're, we're saving, you know, police resources, if you like. Because yeah. they might be firearms officers, but at the end of the day, they're policemen as well. So, do you offer these courses, these these had courses, do you offer them to the public? Not yet. It will be. So I, I can tell you what's going to happen, Owen, is um, uh, DMQ, uh, for their sins, are going to be taking this on. They, they're developing a HAG course, yep. um, which is when this is going to be offered to um, other constabularies, it will be an entry base which people will have to pass to yep. actually um, become part of that constabulary HAD team. And then they will do the training which we've done, the classroom work with Bartra and the scenario stuff and about, uh, you know, and the interviewing to, to see the suitable as well. Um, yeah. You know, so um, that that's what that's what's going to happen. Um, whether cover can establish to take it on, a lot of it's been the, actually the insurance and them not wanting uh, civilians with uh, firearms on the highways. But I'll be, I'll be honest with you, I think they're, the civilians, the right civilians, with the right training, are better equipped and have more tools in the box than yeah. the firearms guys. They, they yeah. have shotguns, but yeah. they can only use rifled slugs and SSGs because yeah. that's what the police college say. Yeah. So, um, you know, as we know, 410 is a good tool if you can walk up to it and shoot it. If not, yeah. 12 or far safer than maybe, you know, something that's going to go right through. Yeah. So, you know, I think it will happen. But things don't happen very fast with the police force, but um, the police forces. But we'll, we'll see. It's going to be offered, and the training is right now in Hampshire. And that training, that model, will be offered to other constabularies. Um, and also, you know, I hear horrendous cases where deer are sat waiting for hours and hours. Yeah, and hours yeah. And the response team to get there when yeah. they have a local guy who's far more experienced and can pop in, be there in ten minutes, dispatch the animals safely and humanely within 10 minutes and not waiting hours and hours for an armed response to turn up from the other side of the county. Yeah. So we'll, I we'll see that goes. Um, as regards to tracking, you know, I'd, I'd love to track from the roadside. I can only do the stuff where I know the landowners. I have yeah. done locally, you know, if I, I hear a deer gets hit locally, I will go and track it from the roadside and have found them and dispatch them, but only yeah. with the landowner's permission, of course. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, well done you. It's, um, I remember um, uh, an old commission ranger guy, up in the lakes told me a story about um he he got a call out to a, a deer down on the road and uh, he got there and um the I, it was, I think the story was there, there was a local dustbin lorry had witnessed this woman hit this and she got calmed her down anyway um the guy uh when he arrived when the ranger arrived the dust he says she's just gone off with this deer wrapped in a blanket and took it home she's gonna you know feed it milk <laughs> anyway yeah uh, she says, she's given me this card of where she is, you know, because she knew you were coming out to do it. Anyway, I'm not going to say the name of the guy, but, uh, you know, he's um, he's long left the commission, but and this is probably in the 1990s. Anyway, he got called out to something else. So it wasn't until the afternoon he thought, well, I better go and see what happened, you know. So he goes and knocks on the door, <laughs> this one, and he said, he literally says, oh, yeah, you come in. You know, Billy's fine. He said, Billy, she said, oh, yeah, we're giving him a name. The kids love him. And I walked in and <laughs> <laughs> there's two kids with a row book sat in the middle of them watching Scooby-Doo like <laughs> eyes as big as dinner plates he said he said I says uh, you know it's not the right place for it uh, you, we need to get, take it out and, you know put it back into the forest and um, he said he scooped this deer up put it out put it in the back of his truck and he said it was just bleeding out of every orifice poor yeah. thing was just you know and it took it took it up the road and dispatched it um, but I'm, I'm sure that happens on lots of occasions, doesn't it? These people. The, the, the biggest problem, Owen, is um, uh, getting out to the general public who to call when this happens. No, yeah, we all, you and I both do social media, and you see stuff locally. Oh, somebody so and so's hit a deer. Phone the wildlife hospital. Phone this. Phone that. Yeah, you know, if it's alive and it's on the road, it's nine nine nine, regardless yeah. of where you are in the country. Yeah. You know, the police will sort it out one way or another. They'll either get one of their Humane dispatch team members out or their armed response will come and do it. Um, uh, even the wildlife hospitals, my local wildlife hospital phone me now because people phone them and then she phones me and I, I go and dispatch it because she knows as fluffy as she is that these animals can't, if they're on the roadside, then normally their injuries are such that they can't be mended or repaired. 
and yeah. the kindest thing is actually to dispatch it. So that's from the wildlife hospital. They phone me. What's happening? That just delays the suffering because what happens? They phone yeah. me. I have to phone into the control room to get an incident number. So I'm covered by constable insurance. I can't do the dispatch until the police officer gets there because that's the way it is. We told them uh, we, we can't dispatch unless there's an officer there because it's our safety on the road. So that just d- delays the suffering by people phoning the wrong, the RSPCA or the um, wildlife hospitals. Yeah. The RSPCA now that they only got a 24 hour number. I think it, it stops after about six o'clock, I think. So, um, but we're working with the RSPCA, believe it or not, the wildlife department to try and get this scheme running nationally for other constabularies. So at least they're on board. If they're telling people to phone 999, then people maybe will, listen to them and, and do it if you see an animal that's alive and it's on the road phone 999 um, and i mean down where you are i'm sure i mean I, I, you're not right down in the forest are you so you'll have similar sort of number i've got oxfordshire and you'll be having fallow row and munchak as your staple really won't it which is the yeah. one that's most susceptible to rtas that they, they all it? are owen um probably the fallow and the numbers get too big in certain areas um so munchak the- Muntjac are terrible. I so say you, you, there's a lot of urban uh, Muntjac where I am yeah. in towns, um, and they're very prone to getting stuck in cars and being alive. I did three yeah. last year that were actually stuck in the grill of cars and still oh. alive. So that's, you know, when you turn up to that, if, if you haven't got the experience, you, you know, it, you need to know to, need to know how to deal with that one. Um, yeah. It's happened three times to me in the last year where Muntjac, nice bucks too, have been stuck in the grill of little... Two of them are Citroen Saxos. I don't know what it is about Saxos, but... I, they, I saw a story years ago in, in one of the newspapers, one of the tabloids, or I think one of the lads who helped me sent me a, you know, it was a, a photograph, and, and someone would have hit, hit something and, and got out and looked, thought she'd missed it, but he was actually wedged in the, you know, the air the air scoop yep. at the front, drove all the way to work, yep. and it wasn't until she got to work, somebody says, there's a muntjac there, and they took a picture of it, and there's this muntjac sort of wedged in the front of the... Yep, it, it happened Happens Crazy. a lot. I remember, and I'm sure he won't, um, he won't mind mentioning his name. Charles Smith Jones, when he was in Hampshire, was part yeah. of the HAD team. And I remember he had one, and a guy drove to the petrol station in our local town and then phoned up and said, that I've got a deer that's still alive and stuck in the front of my car. And I believe he actually dispatched that one with a knife because it was the only safe option. Um, it was humane because he knew how to do it. Um, and, and yeah, because you, you, you've got to think, you know, are you going to damage a car by shooting into it? So, yeah, uh, cool, cool. normally that, because that's the last thing on your mind. Um, normally, the deers cause so much damage anyway. Last one I did, it smashed all the um, air conditioning radiator and the radiator up anyway, but was very much alive. The, the WP said it was a stand, the police officer was there. She said, Are you going to take it out? I said, No, I'm not. Um, Muntjac can cause a lot of damage, as you know. Um, our friend Richard Evans, his dog got ripped up by one of the professional stalker down in the New Forest. Uh, in Labrador, did both sides of the Labrador ripped up the side of it. Um, one of my beaters uh, on a neighbouring estate, her dog got tore up by Muntjac. Yeah, and if you get near them, too. you get hold of them and they're mobile and you get a good buck that's got a good tough. It will go for you as well. Yeah. That's the only way it knows how to defend itself. And it can do a lot of damage. I saw it years ago uh, in the Cotswolds on a on a um, his cox day at the end of the season, and um, I, I was stood in this valley, and this spring had come over the or the Munchak book came over the back over the top of the bank and down yep. through the brambles and out to the side, and the springer was just right behind it, and it hit the next load of brambles, and the springer went, you heard this, Woo! and yep. the Munchak come out, and the spaniel didn't, and yep. we went to it, and it just like you got a knife and pulled it along the side of it. It was absolutely horrible. The, yeah. the dog was the dog was fine after about 30 stitches, but it just cut it all down one side like you'd yeah. use a craft knife on it. Horrible. Um, it, it, they can do a lot of damage. And as we well, know, I'm, if a stalker and you skin them, you know, tough they are around here because that's well, where I, they fight. I carry a lot of mine out in a row sack um, that Sylvia Muddyman made. And uh, I need to get hold of it because I've just, I've got a, uh, I've cut an hole in it from a book before Christmas, his teeth have just gone into it, you know, put it in and, and it's just caught on it and he's just pulled a nick in it now and it just leaks out into the bottom of my bag. But um, they're phenomenal weapons, the Munjack, and it's one of the, uh, I yeah. love them, I do. They're uh, still one of my favourite deer to uh, to stalk and everything. Like it's, it's one of those deer that 
it's kind of to some people it's a complete vermin in the pest species and to other it's a sporting asset and I'm somewhere in between that with whatever whatever area I'm managing you know what I mean if I'm, I'm if it's if it's we've got <clears throat> severe management and we're trying to reduce numbers then it's um uh, they have to be shot um not so selectively but if I'm actually managing them it's a pleasure to see, you know to keep them old books and let them manage their own territories and see them you know see them regularly and see them grow and but uh, they reckon it could already be our most numerous deer tony what do you think i i think you're right obviously they're very difficult to count because of the size and they as i say they're very urban now as well um they're a real success story they're here to stay um and interesting i saw one up in the little trap between those houses they can't be as you know they can't be rehabilitated so if you do take them to a wildlife hospital you can't let it go back into the world no, uh, it, you are, have to dispatch it. So the, the RSP saying people who are letting these things go are actually breaking the law. Yeah, but anyway, it's, it's you know. also I, I think of, of finding kids. I've seen on social media. There's, there's one at the moment on social media where somebody's picked a kid up and got this little kid sprinting around the, um, around the you know the house with the dogs and stuff like that. And it, it's kind of. I'm sure it was just, you know, been left somewhere and their dogs flushed it out and they ran to the next bush or whatever and they've picked it up and brought it back and they think they're doing, they think they're doing their uh, the right thing and it's probably just been better to have left it where it was. But uh, well, they they, they make very good pets. So it's highly illegal to keep one as a pet now. You're not allowed to keep them as a captive. But um, I've got a few friends that have got them. Um, well, I think mate's got one that's nine years old now. This doe lives in the garden, quite happy. Really? Um, yeah, so it play, so it obviously make He's good obviously pets. not a gardener. <laughs> no. <laughs> Would you have one in yours? Because I know you're no. a very keen gardener. No. <laughs> All the tops of them prize onions going, Tony. What do you <laughs> Absolutely. That'd be the end of that, wouldn't it? So uh... <laughs> It would. It would. Well, that's been really interesting what you told us. Um, I Obviously, I, I've known you for years and everything, but I don't really know. What, are you, you're a keeper, aren't you? Yep, full full time. Um, small small shoot up uh, in the corner of Hampshire. Um, not massive days. We shoot once a fortnight. Um, partridge and pheasants. Um, anywhere between a hundred and two hundred birds days. You know, depending on the on the boss. So uh, yeah, but we're surrounded by the bigger ones. But uh, yeah, it's a big industry. If you don't, you know, you're a shooting man. So yeah. shooting is massive, um, and we're under a lot of pressure at the moment from people that don't understand it. Um, oh, and we need to keep ourselves clean and and show you know show the way it is really. How it all yeah, I'm, I'm, my shooting's changed really because I, I've probably said this on other podcasts, so I'm repeating myself a bit. But I have gone from shooting reasonably big days, 150, 200 birds, you know, in the late nineties, into that, and and losing the love for it a bit. You know what I mean? The the people I used to shoot with, I was probably always the youngest. Those guys have grown older and perhaps aren't shooting anymore or haven't got the budget to do that and everything. And I kind of, you know, had a young family. I couldn't really afford it. And I kind of ended up having our own little shoot, our own duck ponds and stuff like that. And the, you know, the lads helped me with that and we, we enjoy that thoroughly. And that's the way I've kind of gone. And if I'm buying any days now, we've got an estate near to us. We buy these little like 80 to hundred bird days and they're, they're, they're just such a lovely day. You've still got all the, you know, it's on a proper estate, you know, um, so you've you've got all this beautiful parkland. It's all laid out, and you're just shooting the, you know, probably only doing one quarter of the drive to get the birds over us. And we really pick our birds, and um, we generally do an early season partridge, and then one in January. And the one we've just done in the last one we did, we had a beautiful day where it's quite windy. We picked the birds. We had four or five drives, and it was just one of the really you know, memorable days of this season, really enjoyed it. And that that's where I see the future of it. And, you know, we all took the bag. We took the whole bag between, there's eight or nine of us. Um, one of the lads that took the majority of the bag, he's got another sheep that I'm in, and he puts all that food back into the sheep dinners and that, you know what I mean? So his missus makes mm. pheasant rogue and Josh and all that. And it's, it's, it, it's, a, it's a pleasure to see it all going where the keeper's not looking at you and thinking, well, I've got, you know 40 brace um you know left to get rid of and uh do you, do you manage to get rid of all your game yeah we, we've got a very good game dealer but yeah we, we use as much as we can but our game dealer picks up what we don't use i yeah. think shooting 
you know, I've been at it a while now. I think shooting um, as game shooting has become a lot more popular now. Certainly I'm involved with sort of loading and beating, beating on some of the bigger states local to me. And it, it, they, they are doing more and more day because it has got more popular. But I, I'm yeah. with you that I prefer the smaller, even walked up days with my Spaniel with a few mates and get just as much fun out of that. And then yeah. you know, um, shooting a few birds and taking them home and prepping them and eating them. And I think that's the way shooting's got to go to survive. But there, there will always be the big bag days. They'll always have yeah, yeah. people want it and, and fair play. We're all in the same industry. We're all in it together. So yeah. but I think it's hard to justify a thousand bird day to a non-shooter. Yeah, it is just blasting birds out of the sky. It's hard um, to justify it to me, to be honest. I well, yeah, be honest. I mean, yeah, yeah but I some people have that money, and it is providing you know local income and local yeah. uh, employment um, for the countryside pubs and restaurant and clothing, all the yeah. things that go with shooting. So I can't knock it, but I just think it's harder to justify the big days to a non-shooter, whereas you know the smaller days are, are much more justifiable. And I, our sport, as I said earlier on, is under attack from from the outside from from people and and people listen to those people uh and yeah. they take what they say as gospel um unfortunately you know gamekeeper I, I am a keeper of game i think i should we should have a different title because you know that gamekeeper word's been used by people that are against us and, yeah. and they, they they think we all do bad things we we don't i'm i i love you know i'm a big ornithologist i love my bird spotting and me too me as too as i can so but I saw you'd done some ringing on your. Um... Yeah, we have. Yeah, with the RSPB, um, the guys come out with a stone curlew. So, uh, fantastic. Um, yeah, we, we we I'm very lucky, you know, where, where this part of Hampshire has, has got a lot to offer. Uh, and yeah. don't forget all these shooting estates, the stuff they put down. You know, the woodland was put there for shooting 100 years ago or 200 years ago, yeah. uh, and it's providing a lot of cover for wildlife other than than sporting. You know, so. Um, and if that stops, then um, what, where's the incentive for farmers in the states to actually maintain that? Exactly um, for wildlife. The, the, I mean, the, these steward, the steward, the steward stewardship schemes and wild bird seed schemes that they go into, they benefit um, game bird shooting. Well, they benefit all. But, you know, your deer population loves them as well, don't they? You know, um, yeah. but for me, as um, my dad's a bit of a Oh, he's not a bit of a, he, he really is a birder, you know, and, um, and as I've got older, I've, I mean, I've always loved birds and watching birds and stuff like that, you know what I mean? And as, and it's part of, if you're out stalking, one of the things when I sort of like started deer stalking, to sit in a high seat or just sit quietly and watch a green woodpecker, you know, going about its business or, a, you know, um, I don't know, a nuthatch going round a tree, you know, I, those kind of things, those observations I love. And I, I, I honestly think, whether it's I, I'm looking for them more now, but I really think I'm seeing a much more diverse um, bird population in my own garden. You know, it's just we've got goldfinches coming in the 20s, 30s. We've had this week, we've had siskins and um, linnets and um, red poles. And then I saw a black cap last week actually on the edge of the garden. So, um, but I'm, I am feeding heavily to get a mirror, if you know what I mean. But um, I can't remember. 20 years ago that that was you know no. our, our, the diversity of birds that we got in the gardens or in the woodlands that we're in no. you know well I, I i do a lot of supplementary feeding this time of year you know i, I feed the wild birds yeah um, I, but at the moment i'm building a lot of boxes for um, barn owls little owls kestrels um lots of lots of blue tip boxes and stuff like that you know so i do my bit as i'm sure a lot of people in my profession do you know for the um for the for the wildlife as well i think it's part part of my job um i do it off my own back i mean i'd make the boxes i'd bake yeah. the stuff and build them myself in my own time and put so the out. game I, season finishes for you and then you're rolling your sleeves up and getting stuck into your colour, are you well abs- well you know i wish <laughs> <laughs> yeah i should be um i, I really knew need the crack on I, I i got about three three weeks during january where it absolutely goes mad yeah, um, I didn't much at all, but yeah, I, I've, I've got. I need to get on top of these fallow. I, I've got some mates because I, I haven't got much ground. Probably got about two thousand acres. Um, yeah, what I do, which has got a lot of fallow, uh, and the neighbours aren't managing stuff, so we need to get on and 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 shoot. You know, cull some of these. To be honest, they're very um, difficult to get around fallow after Christmas, aren't they? They get. They you are, know what I mean? I think they got. You know, the days are no, going. You know, we're getting nothing for them at the game dealers. No, no, 
that's, that's I, I'm very lucky. I sell mine. I've got because I'm no, and all stalkers should be registered as food businesses. Yeah, um, I can sell skin carcasses to other food businesses, i.e., pubs. Yeah. So, um, and it's worth doing. You should get more more for your buck. All right, it's a bit of pain in our skin in sometimes, but that's the way. That's the way the the pubs, the chefs want it. They want yeah. a skin carcass, and they they take the carcass in or half carcass in, and um, they deal with it. That you know, that's the way they want it. And I get more than I would sell into the game dealers. So yeah, um, I, just... I I supply local butchers, and then yeah. um, and and then I started using again. I've said this on these podcasts. I started using um, a Facebook page called Giving Up the Game. Yeah. I've seen it, yeah. I've I think seen it. that was, I'm blessed with, I bring everything home to a home larder in Staffordshire and there's no one shooting deer in my area. So I get a lot of people coming down from sort of like Derbyshire, Nottinghamshire, uh, and then out of Birmingham. We're about 40, 40 minutes outside of Birmingham. Those people are, that, are, are, you know, have a go cooks. That have, um, yeah. and, but I, again, I obviously sell it, you know, they're all tagged, but I sell them in the skin and I, I what of them they'll say, oh, can you skin it for me? And I know, well, I can't. And uh, and I don't really want to, and I haven't got the time, and I get good money for them. But that that initially using giving up the game yeah. has given me now uh, probably 30 or 40 numbers of people that want it. So when you know you've got some, or we know we're going to do a column, we're going to have a dozen or so, Muntjac or whatever, um, and Muntjac used to be always the one I struggled to get rid of. You know what I mean? And and now it's the one, the Avago, you know, um, yeah, skin yeah. Prep chef types. That's the one they want, you know, because it's beautiful to eat, isn't it? You know, yeah. and um, so I just, it, it's, in the old days, you used to shoot 20, 30 fallow in a few days with the lads and ring up the game dealer. The lorry used to back up and we, I think at one point it was three pound a kilo, dare I say. And we used to back the lorry up and then a month later, whew, if you're lucky and you rang him three times, you got to check, you know, and uh, <laughs> it, was, uh, it was back of the net, you know, uh, but, but now you have to sell every individual carcass, um, you know, and, and, and this year, the, the wet weather, you know, we've had such wet weather, haven't you? It's, yeah, it's, yeah. it's nothing's easy getting stuff out, getting it off, you know, dragging stuff out. It's just, everything gets filthy. It's just not, not been a good winter for, um, for nice frosty mornings, you know what I mean, or a, a nice cold spell, a nice cold spell. Um, but yeah, I'm back out tomorrow, um, and I, and then I've got clients coming in, got some Italians and some Spanish coming, uh, no, some Spanish and then some French coming. So we're, yeah, we're busy for the next month. Uh, all our foreign travels, me and Dan have done, um, are now over. We uh, had an incredible. Um, week in spain on uh, monteria and then off to the for a chamois and um yeah we've been, been back a week now and it's a, i'm still tired from it but that was an incredible experience um, excellent have you ever done any foreign hunting um only only sort of denmark and sweden yeah yeah well still we were in sweden uh on an aim point event in in um the beginning of december that was fantastic mm. so i'd never been on an hunt where there was like knee deep driven snow and it had just arrived the whole of sweden uh that week was white over and they thought they hadn't had that for about 30 years they said and um we hunted on a massive estate that had fallow wild boar on it and it was um you know they did it totally differently but everything was you know very regimented and set out they had um uh, specific plans that you know they, they detailed everything that we uh, were allowed to shoot what we weren't allowed to shoot there was heavy fines for the things we weren't allowed to shoot. So, yeah, yeah. you know, it made the um, made made everybody look twice, you know. And uh, but it was a fantastic experience. But um, I've never hunted in Denmark. I went. The only, I've only been to Denmark a few times, uh, and I went to a big hunting show there, the Yacht and Fiskery. Have you ever been to that? No. That's like um, they have it every two years, and it's their big um, hunting show. And the thing, if it's still the same, I don't know. This was probably, again, 20 years ago. They had one hall that was full of outfitters. And you know the Danes like to travel and hunt, don't they? They go all over the world. They're a big, small population, but a high, uh, a shoot, high number of those are hunters. It was the taxidermy and outfitters. And they were just it was just like a hall. And people were just booking hunts. 
and 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 then side by side was the their taxidermists and it, there's these huge dioramas of um, you know ibex or whatever you know and it just it was incredible really impressive but i haven't been to denmark much but well, I'd just like to say, Tony, we've had a good hour chewing the fat here. And what I really yeah. wanted to find out was about UK DTR and your HAD courses and um, what you've been up to. And I really appreciate your time. Pleasure. Um, it's been a pleasure um, talking to you. And uh, a, a podcast, as I said, that is really our blood, sweat and tears, tears um um, you know, strap line is, is yours is the what yours has been specifically about that, which I appreciate. So uh, thank you very much. I look forward okay. to seeing you uh, perhaps at the stalking show or something like that. If you're up in the Midlands, keep in touch and uh, I wish you all the best. Thanks, Owen. We will see you at the stalking show. We, we shall be there. The other boys will be there and I will be there. So, uh, yeah, looking forward to it. Catching up. Well, I've got Dave. My next podcast should be Dave actually about the stalking oh, show. It's a little gem, isn't it? That is. It's... Oh. Uh, it's the, I was talking, to somebody, talking to somebody about it the other day and I said, flipping, what a show that is. It's the most hands-on, practical. Fantastic. It's it's purely what we've got. No bloody garden furniture or... No. <laughs> I, I, I made a comment on, a, on one of the stalking forums tonight. Um, somebody said, oh, are you going to the shooting show? No, I'm not. It, it's 25, 30 quid to get in. So much to park. Um it's just rubbish. Um, the stalking show, you know, a little bit further up, the old show ground there, fantastic. It's got everything you do. No, no jacuzzis or candy floss. It is purely stalking, hunting, optics, rifles, bullets, you know, the whole thing. It's also a nice size that you can have a good look round yeah. and, and, and meet people, yeah. chat with people, it's a good size there's plenty to do there's that area that you can sit in and have a listen and have a bit of a break they've always got you know talks and demonstrations on um, and long may it continue I think they've done a great job with it and I, it, I think it's going from strength to strength but uh, I'll say I'll find that out in my next podcast <laughs> to watch it anyway it's been a pleasure take care mate thank you very much see you later good luck with your call yeah cheers buddy